Look at you guys, man, a bunch of tent dwellers. I love this. Here we are under the big top. We're under the tent. Yeah, tent dwellers. I promise you, I'm not going to start yelling at you. I'm not going to call down fire and brimstone or resort to any kind of, you know, revivalist kind of style, though it's tempting. It's just tempting. Yeah, I don't know. It just makes me feel a little mischievous. Like, like we're under the big tent. Welcome to everyone who's streaming, and we're so glad that you're with us. Wish you were under here. It's a beautiful day. We opened up some walls, let a little cross breeze in. Uh, got a little warm in first hour. It's perfect. Like, yeah, uh, incredible. How fitting it is that we're gathering under a tent as we give thought to the idea that we live temporarily in a tent that like God's view of life for us is that we are sojourners, that we live in a tent, that heaven is our home. This world is not our home. And so we're actually sitting in an ongoing metaphor for the series that we launched today called sojourn. Now, sojourn isn't a word that we use every day, but most of you know a sojourn is like a temporary dwelling. It's to live somewhere just for a little while, like we're on a sojourn, and uh, we're temporarily meeting in this tent, not in our permanent home, which is being uh, refurnished, which is being re re refreshed in our facility. And so we're, we're here under the tent, and, and that's the way we live life too. So what we're doing is we're going to walk through one of the most incredible chapters in all of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 11. You could turn there with me right now. We're going to spend five weeks going through these 40 verses where we find that these great heroes of the faith actually uh, sojourned in a way that was characterized by faith and that their faith was commended accordingly. And so the way we're using sojourn, drawing from this chapter, is this idea that our sojourn is our journey of faith through this world to the next world, uh, to the world to come. So our, our uh, sojourn is our journey of faith through this world to the next world. Now, Many of you are aware of this whole topic of eternal perspective, of, of re reminding, you know, remembering that our world's not, uh, this world's not our home, but we're living for a world to come. That's not new to you. But oftentimes we can just forget that. And at times we find ourselves hoping that this world will actually come through for us, that it will be great, that all of our relationships are going to be perfect, that we're going to have this ongoing deep satisfaction when in reality the scriptures say that some of what will characterize our life is what the scriptures call groaning that there is a sense of groaning because we're waiting to go home there is a homesickness that characterizes us because we are aware that we live in a broken world that doesn't always make the sense we want it to make. And so like, we're all kind of like wanting to be in our new home. So, um, you know, sometimes that uh, God uses that to get us focused on the world to come. In fact, I love what uh, the author Mark Buchanan says. Let me read this to you. He goes, the truth is we're always a bit restless. I don't know if you can relate with that. We're always a bit restless. We're supposed to be. It's a divine ruse to keep us from making permanent settlement this side of eternity. Our citizenship is in heaven. Between now and then, we live as sojourners, Bedouins, exiles, tent dwellers. Sound familiar? There is always a little sand in the sheets. There's always a sense that over there is better than right here. God lets us groan now to woo us heavenward. That even now, during this series, under this tent, that God is saying, remember, you're not home yet. Remember, this world, it's not a perfect place. It's marred by sin and brokenness, but I've got something I want you to do while you're here. And then we're, I'm going to take you home. There's going to be this great, great 
world to come that's coming. So uh, we're going to look at that. Now, in chapter 11, let me kind of preview a little bit. Uh, when you think about the entire chapter, probably a, a, a couple of very key verses to orient you to the chapter would be verses 9 and 10. Again, just by way of introduction, let, let me read these two verses to you, talking about Abraham. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise for what? He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Now, throughout this chapter, one right after another, one right after another, we're going to be introduced to what the writer calls the men of old, whose uh, faith was, uh, uh, that, that God commended the faith of these men of old. And so we'll walk through all these different characters. Now, today, we're only going to look at seven verses. In fact, let me preview that with you, that uh, the big idea of today's message is that faith brings commendation at the end of our sojourn. Faith brings commendation at the end of our sojourn. So uh, sojourn is a word that uh, appears uh, throughout uh, in the chapter, but the word commending uh, finds itself five times in this chapter, four of which are in the seven verses we're going to look at today. And so you'll see me highlight that word because the idea is there, as we go through our sojourn, it's the faith that we live, the faith we demonstrate that at the end of our sojourn brings commendation. All right? And so we'll look at three things about faith, commending faith. First of all, we're going to talk about the nature of faith. Like what is, what is faith? Like how do you define it? Uh, the nature of faith. And then we'll look at the need for faith. So why is faith important? Why, why do we have to live by faith? What's at stake there? The need for faith. And then we'll look at Noah's faith, which will be fun to look at Noah's faith. So that's kind of where we're going for the morning. I'm going to read these seven verses we're going to look at. And then we'll jump in in more detail. You can follow along. Chapter uh, 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. All right? That's like the whole chapter is unfolding. These people of old who received their commendation at the end of their sojourn. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. But, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, uh, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Wow, man, I just love this passage. I love this topic. I personally, and I'm not the only one, who believe that one of the most dynamic motivations for living a radically committed Christian life is what we call eternal perspective. That God is going to commend those who live a life of faith. And what we're going to be reminded of this morning is this, is that our presence with God for eternity is not based on what we do for him. It's based on what he's done for us, right? You see Christ, he died on the cross for us, paid up for our sin. All who believe in that receive eternal life. Like you, you can't lose it. So our presence with God is really based on what he did for us. But the idea of pleasing God, that comes from a life of faith. A life of obedience that comes right out of faith in God and God's word. 
And what we're going to see for our encouragement is all these different examples. So anyway, I keep introducing the message. Let's get into it. All right. So first of all, we said we're going to look at the nature of faith. Now, just direct your words here at uh, your attention to the first couple of verses. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. This word for assurance had the idea of um, almost like guarantee. Uh, it had the idea of, um, of, of something being attested to. So like uh, in legal context, you know, if you're going to attest that this property belongs to you, we can't have the wind doing this to me. Tent life. <laughs> it's just a broken world that we live in. No, so it had the idea of attestation, like you're being attested to, something assured, something guaranteed. It's the assurance of things hoped for. And then it says it's the conviction of things yet seen. And so when we think about faith, it really embraces facts uh, of, of a, a reality that you really can't put under the microscope. You can't, you know, it doesn't lend itself to empirical science. It doesn't lend itself to being proven in any sense of the word. There are things that are not material or natural in nature, that there is this spiritual unseen reality that God belongs to, that faith is the assurance of things, over the conviction of things not seen. It's not only a reality that's not seen, but it's a reality, a coming reality that's unforeseen, that there is a future, this world to come, uh, there are promises that God makes about the future that, like, how do you know this is going to happen? How do you know that's going to go down? Well, you, by faith, you embrace it. Now, one of the things we also just need to remember, or otherwise you'll go off the rails, is that the faith he's talking about is embracing what God reveals through his word. In other words, you can't just hope you know, it's the assurance of anything that you hope for. Otherwise, all of you would be driving Ford F-150s. <laughs> you're, you're all hoping for one. You want one, I know. It's not just whatever. It's, it's according to God's word. So he's going to talk in a minute about we understand from the word of God that that creation came about. Uh, later, when we, in regard to Noah, he's going to say that he received warning from God. And so people aren't just imagining things. Faith is the idea of embracing a reality that is revealed by God through his word. Embracing that. In fact, the first kind of takeaway idea that I want you to think about today is this. Is that commendable faith, that's what the chapter is talking about, commendable faith perceives God. He, uh, of this kind of faith is spiritually perceptive. Because sometimes you can't, you can't see it, you may not feel it, but based on God's word, by faith, you embrace the reality of it. Now, there was a Spanish writer named Carmen Corde who wrote a story, tells the story of a young woman who gives birth to a blind child. And uh, she doesn't want her blind son to be aware of his defect. And so she refuses all members of the family to talk about anything like sight or beauty, you know, tree, like, like, don't, don't say anything or use any kind of terms that introduce the idea of sight. In fact, she went so far as asking neighbors and friends of the family not to use any of that kind of language to protect her son. And then one day, according to the story, the strange girl comes over the fence at the garden, enters the uh, young man's world, and uses all the forbidden language. And all of a sudden, his whole world just becomes different. It just kind of, you know, comes crashing down around him. And you see, the idea is that many of us live with this sense of darkness about things because we don't believe, we think that this is the world, this dark world we live in. And God comes in through his word and through his people and they share truth from God. 
And it's like it doesn't seem to fit their reality. It's like a voice from outside. And so someone lives in a world of darkness from guilt and shame. And they could never, ever believe that a God would forgive and love. And so in their darkness, the light of God's word, they hear that, it comes in, and are they going to embrace it as true or says, that's not my experience? But faith, the faith that's going to be commended is a faith that perceives the truth of these things. Some people live in the darkness of fear. And God says, I'm present with you. Well, Lord, I, I don't see you. I don't hear you. Well, faith says, I believe that to be true. I reckon it to be true, in the words of the old King James. Faith says, even though I worry the darkness of my worry, I believe the light that there is a God who's in control of my life, who's at work for his glory and my good. Faith embraces a reality that you may not normally see or acknowledge. It's just a world of darkness that you know. And the enemy wants to protect you in that darkness. But God breaks in with the light of that. There are people that, that just wrestle with all kinds of things. So faith embraces a reality. Um, Philip Gancy says in his book, Rumors, of uh, another world. He says, uh, you need eyes to see and ears to hear. Jesus said to those who doubted him, it takes the mystery of faith always to believe, for God has no apparent interest in compelling belief. Faith has ears to hear and eyes to see. I wonder if you do this day in this tent, this temporary structure that we're in, that we live in, that there's a world to come. And that all that you might be experiencing right now is temporary. There is a commending, commend, uh, commendable faith that really perceives God. He talks uh, next, moving beyond the nature of faith, to this idea of the need for faith. And so as we come back to the passage, we have uh, read about faith that understands that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Again, we see that faith embraces what's not seen. Um, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. If you would just mentally circle that word acceptable, that God a, a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by what? accepting his gifts and through his faith though he died he still speaks and so a uh, part of what we're going to learn here is the need for faith is that faith's needed for relationship with God to be accepted by God that we come to him with faith I'll talk about uh, describe that more in a moment he goes on he says by faith Enoch uh, was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Now, you may have noticed that the writer of Hebrews here is just drawing from the very earliest chapters of Genesis, isn't he? So he talked about creation, chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 4, you have the whole Cain and Abel scene, where they both approach God in worship. Cain brings an offering from the ground. Uh, Abel brings an offering from the flock, okay? So there, uh, people imply, okay, there was sacrifice and that was the way to approach God and that could be involved in that. But what the writer of Hebrews says is the difference between the two was that Abel came with faith and Cain did not. Uh, the second thing is that you find Enoch and so, again, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, you get this incredible statement that Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more. And you read that, and you think, what? Yeah, Enoch walked with God, and then God just took him. 
as if God said, you know, I'm just ready for you to be here with me. And so Enoch doesn't experience physical death. They weren't able to find his body. God just took him to be with him. And we get this comment that, you know, he, uh, but now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Then he walked with God. He was righteous in God. And so we see next that faith is needed for relationship with God. Faith is needed for righteousness from God. And then he goes on and says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God, those who want relationship with God, who want to draw near to God, they must believe that he exists, that's faith, and that it rewards those who seek him. So pretty incredible. Uh, the big takeaway here is that the kind of faith that will be commended, commendable faith is one that pleases God. It's not one that just perceives God, but one who pleases God. And just remember, men and women, the distinction that our presence with God for eternity is not based on, like, how you live your life. It's based on how, what Christ did for you. But pleasing God, having a life of faith that's commended by God is based on faith. And God calls us, and what God shows us in these characters is that the life that pleases God is a life of faith. Um, I, just, I just love that. John 20. Uh, remember when, uh, you know, Thomas, he's listened to all the disciples who say, we saw Jesus. Like, Jesus was raised from the dead. We saw him. Thomas said, yeah, right. I don't believe it. And they said, no, Jesus is alive. And Thomas said, until I can touch the scars in his hands, put my hand inside the wound in his side, I'm not going to believe. And remember, Jesus appears, doesn't he? He appears to Thomas. And he says, put your hand right here. Put your hand on my side. And Thomas bows down to him and says, my Lord, my God. And remember what Jesus says to him? Verse 29, chapter 20, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That God is pleased with faith that embraces what can't be seen or foreseen. That that kind of faith pleases God. It brings commendation from God. Now, that may or may not move you. I, I, I don't know. You know, when you read in Matthew 25 of the parable of the talents, and you remember that those who, like, invested the resources God gave them, they invest those resources in what God's doing in the world, and God said, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've been faithful in a few things, I'm going to make you ruler over many, enter into the joy of the Lord. That may or may not, like, I, I, I get pretty jazzed about that. Now, <clears throat> when my dad uh, passed away, it was like, uh, I think back in like 2016, if I remember. You know, 2016, yeah. I, I got the nod of approval. So I'm so bad on dates. And uh, shortly after that, my stepmom said, Danny, you're going to want to listen to these. And she handed me uh, some cassette tapes. And she said, uh, these were recorded a number of years ago when one night your dad was sitting at the bar. I was in the kitchen doing stuff. And so we're kind of eyeing each other. And I'm at the sink. And he's sitting there. And he started talking. Uh, probably uh, aided by a few uh, drinks that loosened his lips. And he began speaking in a very unfiltered way. And uh, he started talking about his life, different experiences. And he started talking about me. And he didn't know it, but Linda had this cassette recorder and she had turned it on and started recording him. Now, my dad and I were very close when he died, but there was a long time in my life when we were not. When I thought my dad uh, didn't really understand me, respect me, you know, he lived in a completely different world than my world. And so um, when I turned on these tapes and started listening, it was incredible. Things that he said I had no idea that he thought at the time. 
things that he said that were so affirming. Things I had no idea. And in days coming for all of us who live by faith, a day where our Father is going to commend us for the life of faith that we lived. And let me tell you, I'm not trying to be over dramatic here. But I can tell you there are going to be times in heaven when we may all be there and we watch each other one by one get up there and Jesus is going to say, I am so proud of you. You stayed in that marriage that was disappointing and out of loyalty to me, you hung in there to love a husband or a wife that you didn't feel like loved you back. Your friend said, you ought to get out of that thing. And you hung in there. I'm so proud of you. Way to go. I love your faith. And then this person gets up and says, I remember Jesus. I remember when you were in high school and all your friends made fun of you because you're so religious. And you know what you did? You just smiled and said, I believe in Jesus. You didn't back down. I'm so proud of you. And Jesus is just going to come in. He's going to like be beside himself for people that followed hard after him. He commends the faith at the end of our sojourn. Not that we will have gotten everything right, correct? We just won't this side of heaven. But the things that are done to the glory of God, resting in his promises, risking in his purposes, He's just going to embrace that. He's going to commend it. And I tell you, the writer of Hebrews is going through all these examples to make the point to his readers. Don't back down. These are Jewish readers, Jewish Christians. They had come to faith. Uh, They were followers of Christ, but persecution has really set in. And it's become... Uh, very hard to publicly follow after Jesus. And some of them were thinking about just going back into Judaism, not really following through with Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, look, don't, don't do that. Jesus is superior uh, to all the Old Testament. So, like, in other words, the whole book is about he- encouraging them to hang in there. And one of his ways, his strategies is to remind them of all the saints of old who faced difficult situations in this temporary broken world, but their faith was commended during their sojourn and after their sojourn. Commendable faith perceives God and God's word, their spiritual reality. Commendable faith pleases God. He's going to commend accordingly. The last thing that we look at here is the example of Noah. All right? I love this. Okay, so again, each of these characters kind of become an example of what he's saying. And so back in Hebrews 11, because the wind's blowing my pages, it says that by faith, and that's kind of the thing you'll see over and over again 24 times in this chapter, by faith, Verse 7, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So what we learn here of Noah is that he gets this revelation from God, doesn't he? You know, he's warned of God. It's a revelation of future condemnation. Uh, God says to Noah... Man, the sin and depravity of the world is of such a degree that I'm just going to wash the world clean of it. Judgment is coming. And so he communicates that Noah. And now Noah has a choice. Like God says, I want you to build this ark by which you're going to preserve your family. Not just your family, but the human race. And Noah has to decide, do I believe this? And what's interesting is that Noah responds with this reverent fear and begins to construct the ark. And so the the reverence, the the fear 
of like this righteous God who's going to judge sinful man, like that grips him because he believes it. He believes that God exists. He believes that God's going to do what he said. That moves him into this reverence kind of fear that results in him constructing this ark. Now, the result of that is what? That God preserves his family in that God like, is going to start over with, with the human race. And so Noah, because of his faith, actually ends up partnering with God, with what God's doing in the world. It, it, it's unbelievable. Much more could be said about this, but what I want you to take away today regarding faith that's commended, that will be commended, is a faith that really enters in with God, with what he is doing in the world, his purposes. That's what Noah does. Like, yeah, his family's preserved, but it's a bigger thing that's up than that. He says, you're preserving your family because you're going to repopulate the earth. So Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives, like they, they start over again. That God's doing something. You see, God is still at work today. And as most of you know, let me remind you, there is another judgment coming. It's not one by the flood, but that God's going to deal with with sin in our world, that judgment is coming. And he invites all of us to partner with him in what he's doing because God doesn't want to see anyone not know him. It's not God's desire that any would perish. His heart's desire is that people would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so when we think this temporary place that we live in, why are we here? Is it to make more money than the guy next door? Is it to, you know, have the nicest stuff? Or is it to partner with what God's doing? You know, the Christians that really believe in the world to come, they actually do the most in this world. In fact, C.S. Lewis said it this way. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. Man, I believe that. Stephen Nichols is a guy who, uh, he's a big uh, scholar, student of the works of Jonathan Edwards, that 18th century uh, preacher, theologian. And um, he wrote a book called Heaven on Earth, which is basically a commentary on what Jonathan Edwards believed about the world to come. He talked about living in between this present world and this future world to come. And in this book, he says this. I think it's so good. He says, our calling, talking about you and me, he says, our calling is to show the citizens of these earthly and temporal countries that there is a far better eternal country. In the words of C.S. Lewis, we are to point out to those who live in the shadow lands that there is a real world to come. But we are to do more than that. We best point the way to the world to come when we offer glimpses of that world in this one. That is why we're here. Commendable faith partners with God with what he's doing in the world. Like people need to know. Most people are aware that this world is broken. They just don't think there's any alternative. And what they need to hear and see in us is our confidence, this conviction, this assured hope that there is a world to come that's going to be incredible. Where there's no more war, no more tears, and uh, there's no more disease. It's more pandemic. Like, incredible place. And in juxtaposition to that is a real hell. In that we desperately want to bring as many people with us to this world to come. I wonder if you if your sojourn did end now, 
would God find in you faith to commend? It's the initial faith of belief in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, that secures your presence with God. But it's a sojourn of faith that can actually please God and bring commendation, partnering with him in his purposes, uh, really moving forward and perceiving and embracing the spiritual realities of God's word and who pleases God. So um, I'll leave this last quote with you that uh, Philip Yancey in writing basically quotes a, fr a French cardinal who says, saints, uh, saints live in such a way, saints being like uh, Christ followers, live in such a way that their lives would make, not make sense if God did not exist. Okay, I'm going to let that sink in. People of faith, they live in such a way that the world would look at us and say, man, that, that doesn't make sense unless God really exists. And would they find enough evidence in your life that would say, man, you really believe, you really believe God, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, like when people say, you know, economically our world is really you know, it's, it's, it's not real certain, like, what's going to happen. Like, you ought to probably really hold on to your money, but what? You're, you're giving money? What is that about? That doesn't make sense. In, in a world that says, be careful what you say or you might be canceled, and you're talking about Jesus, sharing the gospel, like, that doesn't make sense. But you say, listen, my life isn't limited to this world. It, this world's not my home. Like, I'm just passing through this thing. A sojourn, an adventure of faith. Looking forward to being with Jesus in the world to come. That's the life I want to live. And I trust that you want to as well. Would you stand with me as we prepare to uh, respond to God? And I want to pray for us. Oh, Father, as we uh, stand under this tent, reminded that all of life on this world uh, is to live in a tent, that we are tent dwellers, we're sojourners, this world's not our home, and yet, God, we're so tempted to try to make it our home, to try to settle in here, to be earth dwellers, <laughs> yet, God, faith embraces the reality that at any moment our sojourn could come to an end, that one day it will when you return, that one day, God, after a time of judgment, that you're going to usher in the world to come, a new heavens and a new earth. God, use us to bring many people into your presence that they might enjoy that as well. We ask in Jesus' name.